I'm Lise Todd, lecturer here in Festival and Event Management. Um, I have a background which is in events and in marketing. Uh, Jane asked me to come and speak for around 30 minutes on marketing theory, and I said, oh, okay then. And then I thought, hmm, actually, um, there's so much you could talk about, obviously, when it comes to marketing. So what I'm not going to do is spend time talking about marketing strategy and the four Ps and all these things that you're all very, very familiar with. Um, rather, I'm going to touch on a few ideas and concepts in terms of some relatively recent um, academic concepts and theories that are out there, hopefully providing just some thoughts for you to build upon um, and perhaps discuss later on throughout the, the course of the day. So, oh, here we are. So, at the moment, um, what we're seeing a lot coming through in uh, much of the academic theory and also in discussion around that is this idea of experiences. Everybody's talking about experiences. You know, what do we mean by experiences? How can we create memorable and engaging experiences? And a lot of it is around this idea of engagement and immersion. You're know, trying to get your consumers, your customers immersed within the experience itself. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time this morning thinking about experiences, talking about the experience economy, which many of you have quite possibly and probably come across before, um, thinking about marketing and the five steps of staging and engaging experiences, uh, experience design, which is a term that's becoming increasingly popular and fashionable and something that's being discussed a lot. And this idea of how to immerse and engage consumers through hacking into their subjectivity. You know, experiences are inherently subjective and personal to us all. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time thinking about experiential marketing and the three marketing trends which uh, experiential marketing back in the late 1990s predicted for, for the millennium. Um, and then thinking about turning experience into engagement and just finishing up with a few questions. So, first of all, um, the experience economy. Now, as I said, I'm sure many of you have come across this before, but um, just in case you haven't, it's a popular business concept. Um, it was first defined by Pine and Gilmore back in 1998 when they produced a Harvard Business Review paper called Welcome to the Experience Economy, a hugely popular concept. Um, they then produced a book on the topic. It's been translated into 15 languages. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have actually purchased the book, and it was recently reissued back in 2011. Now, as a concept, some of the main... Um, features of it uh, are, are listed there on the screen, but really... What the main drive of the experience economy is, is this idea of the accelerating pace of technological change and how that has differed in the way that people behave, the way that they collect and engage with experiences. Now, um, if you think about it, people collect experiences the way they did objects. If you think about, for example, you're out for a meal, you're at an event, what do people immediately do? They start to take photographs, they start to, to, to post these images on social media, comment about it and so on. It's almost this collection of intangible experiences that are going on around them. Now, Pine and Gilmore have argued that experiences are a fourth and distinct economic offering from products and services, well, commodities starting with and products and services. And they say that because of that, experiences are of real value to um, organisations. They're a progress, progression of the economic value. And moving on from that, they say that the experiences created by organisations are going to matter most within this new technology-driven market. Their source of value for organisations and management must focus upon this idea of creating and embracing experiences. Now, you're probably all sitting there thinking, yeah, OK, well, we are event and festival marketing managers. Events and festivals are experiences by the, their very nature. So we can already see that, um, certainly coming through in the academic literature, there's a lot of discussion about how well the experience economy does reflect um, festival event industry. In fact, when the authors were writing the particular text, a lot of the examples they use are from the American leisure and events industry. So, so moving on to um, this idea, when I, I mentioned that experiences are a, a new source and a distinct source of value for organisations. Now, Pine and Gilmore um, offered this particular framework to explain what they meant by that. Um, it's maybe a little bit difficult to read, but you can probably see that they have four particular types of um, offers. We've got commodities, moving to goods, to services, and to exp experiences. Now, each of these um, offers a different opportunity to, to organisations. 
Um, we have the undifferentiated commodities, moving up to differentiated experiences, which mean you can increase your competitive position. Along the bottom axis, the market of commodities um, is, is a mass market through to a more um, premium market towards experiences. Now, an example of this could be the coffee industry, for example. They discuss this within the experience economy, where the coffee industry started with extracted commodities, coffee beans, which we grew, which we farmed, and then perhaps sold on for people to, to create their own coffee. Moving on to the manufacturing of instant coffee from grinding the beans, which then sold within supermarkets, and so on. The goods are largely undifferentiated. And then um, moving on to the service economy, where coffee was then produced, sold within cafes, and then ultimately to the staging of experiences. Now, the example given there, one we're all familiar with could be Starbucks. You go into Starbucks now and it's become more of a staged experience. You go in, you order your coffee, they ask what your name is so you can collect your coffee. There are all the stories of Starbucks, they've got all the sensory stuff around there. And even increasingly now, this sort of idea is being seen more in all these independent and um, craft brewed coffee shops and so on. Um, James Gilmore actually gives a really good explanation of um, how we can learn about the progression of economic value from the birthday cake. Um, so I'll let him explain that. Okay, so um, nice plug for the book there as well, Experience Economy, you probably noticed. As Jim, James Gilmore says there, people will pay more for a memorable and differentiated experience that will remain with them. Um, you know, how does that relate to events? You know, events obviously are experiences, but what, what could you actually do as event um, and marketers and event managers to create these more memorable um, events? So what we can say is it, 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 experiences are a source of value. But what do we actually mean by experiences and what are the nature of experiences and how can we relate that to, to events? Now, Pine and Gilmore also offer this particular model, which they call the four realms of experience. Um, and it talks about the nature of experience and how experience is formed. And what they um, essentially say is that there are two axes there, um, the horizontal one to do with levels of participation within an experience. So we can quite passively participate in an experience, you know, as you are doing now at the moment, you're sitting here quite passively, or we can be more active in our participation in an experience, actually taking part in something, um, being physically engaged in some way or emotionally or spiritually or something like that. And then the other ax axis is to do with um, levels of absorption. You can be merely absorbed in an event or perhaps fully immersed within that. 
And within there, there are four particular realms or quadrants. Now we have entertainment, you know, we could say that all events have entertainment within them somewhere. Um, we're all interested in being entertained. Um, we have educational events such as seminars, conferences, dance lessons, cookery lessons, those sorts of things. Um, aesthetic events, perhaps um, exhibitions going along to view something in a gallery, all to do with the visual, what you're actually appreciating from it, where you're not very immersed within the event. And then the escapist events, which are perhaps the most immersed and most active participation types of events, where you're actually launching yourself into, um, I suppose, another world that perhaps isn't even real. You know, examples such as gambling in, in Las Vegas, that sort of thing. Now, what Pine and Gilmore actually say is that it's important to... Um, be able to blur the boundaries between these different quadrants and understand what kind of experience is being offered. They talk about this as being um, enhancing the experience, making the experience more real somehow. And they say the richest experiences encompass all four realms. And they talk about the centre there as being the sweet spot. And I'm sure you've had experiences before that you could relate to being entertaining, educational, aesthetic and escapist. Um, one for me, and um, Jane might agree, because last year we were out in um, Singapore um, delivering a programme on experiences. We were uh, taken to the um, Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. And that's a fantastic example of a place which really does hit the sweet spot. You know, it has these... Um, um, wonderful domes where they have um, the most aesthetic, sensory, pl pleasing um, flowers and, and plants being grown, educational programme, entertainment every day with a light show and so on. And it's purely escapist. It's like being on another planet. It's something that, which is quite extraordinary. So what comes through from all of this as well, of course, is that experience um, and providing these memorable encounters, these immersed experiences, are very, very personal. You know, they're entirely subjective. So, experiences create value. They can be a combination of being entertaining, educational, aesthetic, and escapist. All of these, or just some of these. But what experiences are the most meaningful? Now, Diller et al. did some research with 10,000 consumers. Um, and they asked them what the most meaningful and valued experiences were. And these were the 15 different types of experience which were mentioned most frequently, listed in alphabetical order just to be helpful, but everything from accomplishment through to enlightenment, oneness, redemption, through to truth, validation and wonder. So I really just put that in there because I'm thinking, well, as marketers, you know, perhaps ask the questions of how can these most valued experiences be adapted, applied within a festival or an event setting? Okay, so another ooh, um, aspect um, related to experience is this idea of experience design. Um, as I was saying, as we know, experiences are, of course, subjective. They're something that we have ourselves. They're individual to us. They're unique to us as individuals. Um, now, experience design is... Uh, mentioned quite a lot, it's um, an approach which I suppose first emerged within um, IT, like computing design, games design and that sort of thing, about designing an immersive and engaging experience for IT users. But it's increasingly emerging and being seen across other, other areas. You know, um, Jacobson talks about how it's a new and emerging paradigm, calls for integrative practice for design. Um, so what he's really talking about here is almost like trying to directly engage with the technical quality of subjectivity, trying to understand what will engage people, what will immerse them the most. Um, Berridge, Graham Berridge has written a lot on event design and experience, and he talks about um, experience design, this idea of really being able to create the desired perceptions, behaviour and cognitions amongst people. So it's about trying to understand how you can create particular types of experiences which will engage people, which will be memorable for them. Now, um, I've included this quote here at the bottom from um, Jason Silva, who describes himself as a performance philosopher. Um, hopefully you'll have access to the slides and you can actually go in and watch him talking very passionately about experience design. But he introduces a really interesting idea of being able to um, present or, or produce a, a useful and helpful experience design is this ability to hack into people's own subjectivity. 
multi-dimensional first, ex first person experiences, allowing people to direct their own experience while they're going through um, the experience that you've presented for them, the actual experience that's there. So it's about hacking attention, making them able to script their own narrative as they travel through their experiences. So, as we're seeing, experience design becoming increasingly popular, a way of gauging, engaging with subjectivity. And the two images there, the bottom one is from an event that you might be familiar with. Um, it took place in Edinburgh a couple of years ago, Edinburgh, you know, an immersive game where participants took part in this game based on the streets. They were chased around by actors who were playing zombies. There were real members, or, or, and also actors playing members of the military. There were scientists involved in um, a science programme, an educational programme. So one of these events that really did tap into this idea of the different aspects of the realms of experience and allowed people to create their own narrative through it. The top image um, is, is very entertaining if you want to have a look at the website is dig this in Colorado which you think only in America there is this theme park where you can go along and spend the day driving heavy machinery around such as um, bulldozers and diggers and so on there's some great video clips within that website and tells you how you can go along and do this so again hacking into people's subjectivity obviously not an experience for everybody but hugely popular nevertheless Okay, so how do we translate all of this into marketing approaches? Well, Pine and Gilmore very helpfully offer um, this particular marketing framework. The five steps in marketing and staging engaging experiences. And quite helpfully, it has a good acronym, theme. So it's something we can always remember. Um, I can certainly see the students sitting over there who are helping out today, and they remember that one because they've just been assessed on it. Um, so, of course, the first one, theme the experience. Now, the example we have there and that Pine and Gilmore talk about is Disneyland. Um, you know, there's nothing more themed than Disneyland when you think about it. Uh, they talk about how Disney was created as a living cartoon by Walt Disney. He wanted to create an experience that was going to physically immerse the audience. And he wanted to appeal to uh, adults and children because he'd gone along to theme parks before and been sitting watching his children enjoying themselves while he's sitting on a bench thinking, this could be more interesting. I could do something far more interesting with this. Um, so, theming the experience is how to start. Develop your theme. How do you actually communicate that theme? Do different approaches. Now, the second approach, or second stage, I should say, is to harmonise impressions with positive cues. So, this has been consistent with your theme. You know, for example, all the Disneyland's, Disney resorts, wherever they are, Paris, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and so on and so forth, are really clearly harmonised with positive cues. Um, I personally, I've only visited Disneyland in Hong Kong when I was out there for university business, and that was quite an interesting place for me. Get off the plane, jet lagged, get on a train to go to Disneyland for research, and even the train has Mickey Mouse ears. You arrive, you get out of the train, and there's a strange, surreal piped music, and people of every age walking about dressed as a princess with Mickey Mouse ears on. So, you know, the cast are actually, the staff, I should say, are almost... Um, like cast members, they're performing on the stage, being Disney characters. We don't really know um, who they are a lot of the time. You don't see them because they're presenting a particular performance to, to the front stage. Um, so within that, we have these impressions, takeaways of the theme. They're memories that you're always going to take away with you. Whether or not it's a physical product that you buy, it's something that you'll always associate with that particular experience. So moving on from that, the next logical step is to eliminate any negative cues. So remove any distractions that take away from the theme that you're trying to communicate, ensuring integrity of the experience and so on. You know, Disney employees are always in character whenever they're, they're facing staff. We don't know what they're doing backstage. Um, you know, this comes from uh, performance theory. Um, Gochman and Schechner and um, um, uh, academics like that wrote about performance theory back in the, the mid-1950s, saying that we all act in a particular way depending on who we're actually engaging with. I mean, think about that, it's fairly obvious. We act in a different way talking to friends as we do to work colleagues and dealing with customers and so on and so forth. So think about this idea of eliminating negative cues. The fourth stage is to mix in memorabilia. Um, and it's, the idea of this is uh, sort of thinking about souvenirs and thinking about mementos. You know, people will purchase um, tangible artefacts 
These can be postcards, other souvenirs. It might just be keeping a ticket stub or something like that. Um, you know, in, in Disney, a great example there, the huge gift shops, you see everybody walking around um, in the full Disney regalia, um, seeing Disney princess costumes and so on. But how can we actually relate that to, to events and festivals? Is there some way that we can build in the use of memorabilia to something which is largely intangible and experiential? Something to perhaps think about. And then finally, um, and perhaps one of the most important aspects is to engage all five senses. And this is everything from the music to the visual decor, even the food, even uh, any smells that are around. You know, how can we actually do that? Um, my experience of Disneyland, um, and I'm sure you've all been to Disneyland, maybe more than I have, but I was really surprised when I sat down to eat a meal in a nice restaurant and the carrot slices that came out were cut into the shape of Mickey Mouse's ears. And I was thinking, how on earth? How do you do that? How do you even do that? Um, but it's something that has remained with me and was a memorable and quite engaging experience. And, and believe me, I'm not the target market for Disneyland. So um, it was just a, a, a really interesting touch. So I suppose to sum up, these are the five steps in marketing and creating an engaging experience. How can we use these within the setting of events or festivals? Now, I'll just briefly talk a little bit about experiential marketing, which was, again, another um, concept that I suppose really emerged back in the late 1990s, going into the millennium. Um, Bernd Schmidt's written a book and a few papers about it and continues to do so today. Now, experiential marketing as an approach applies the staging of experiences to goods or services. So it's less dependent on traditional marketing media functions and so on. And its key characteristics, as we see there on the right side of the, the table in comparison to more traditional marketing of products and services, is that first of all, rather than <coughs> focusing on functional features and benefits of products or services, it's all about focusing on the customer experience. That's what's at the core of it. So, you know, what is the experience that results through um, the particular interactions and so on? Uh, that, that take place, what are the triggered stimulants to senses, and so on. The second um, feature is focusing on consumption as a holistic experience rather than narrowly defining products and category ranges. So how can we think about consumption of a festival or event as a holistic experience rather than just purely going along and taking in whatever's happening around you? No, so it's um, perhaps thinking about what, what does consumption of, it, consumption of it mean to somebody? What is the socio-cultural meaning of that event? What's the personal meaning of that event? And how can that relate to the holistic um, experience? Now, another important point is a lot of the marketing, traditional marketing texts talk about how customers are rational decision makers. We've got these decision making and buying behavior models out there, which you've probably all studied at various times. And now experiential marketing says it's really important to recognize that customers aren't only rational, they're also emotional. Um, a lot of decisions are made on an emotional basis. This idea of buying into experiences which are fun, which are fantasy, which are you know, freedom to, to do what you want to do. It's not just about um, going to the shop and buying a toothbrush because you've recognised you need one. You know, people are also emotional in their decisions. And that particularly would apply to festivals, to, to events, those sorts of settings. Because people go along largely because they're motivated by engaging with other people, um, by um, having a good time and so on. And the final feature of experiential marketing, according to Schmidt, is that um, the methods and tools are eclectic. And I think this is something which we see coming through increasingly, and it relates to some of the key trends that he had mentioned, uh, or will, I'll mention shortly, but he mentions in his own, um, his own book. Uh, methods and tools are eclectic, they can be visual, they can be customised. So moving away from your traditional analytical, quantitative and verbal marketing tools to something that's a little bit more unusual, creative, something which... I suppose it's easier now than it used to be in the past for a number of reasons. Now, back in 1999, Schmidt stated that as the new millennium was approaching, three phenomena would signal an entirely new approach to marketing. And, you know, he was, and in many ways he's entirely correct. You know, the, these three trends are the omnipresence of information technology. And just look at the way that that has exploded and grown and just completely continues to grow all the time. 
you know, think about social media, think about smart technology and how far that's come since 1999 and how that's impacted upon the way that we market, the way that we promote and the way that we even communicate. Um, now, the second phenomenon he said that would change the way that marketing is practised is the supremacy of the brand. And at the time he spoke about um, Virgin as being an example of the way things were going because you had Virgin Music, you had Virgin Travel, Virgin Coke, even Virgin Clothing at one time. I don't know if they still have all of these brand extensions, but he seemed to be saying that brand extension is the way to be going back then. And certainly the brand all the way through is something which I would say, personal, from my personal perspective, is highly important. You know, how, how do we work with strong brands? How do we engage with consumers through having them build relationships with our brands and understanding how they can engage with them? And then, of course, the third um, trend that he said would impact is the ubiquity of communications and entertainment. And what he said is, everything is entertainment. And I think that's something, as well, which is coming through more and more. You know, how does that impact upon the marketing of festivals and events? There's, an, in, for example, this growing trend to be seeing events streamed live and so on. How does that impact upon the tangible, or I suppose still intangible, but the actual event as it's taking place? And how can mar mar uh, communications and entertainment be actively used and adapted within the current environment? Now, in terms of um, designing the experiential marketing approach, Jacobson says the way to do that is getting back to the concepts and theories behind experience design itself. So thinking about integrative practice of design. So it's not just about marketing, it's not just about design, it's about thinking how to theme and create something all the way through the process. So it draws skills from various specialisations, various backgrounds, and there's this sort of idea of a clear relationship and synergy and cross-disciplinary associations. Now, um, Froshot and Batat are another couple of academics writing about experiential marketing and tourism and events. And they say there are five main considerations when you think about turning experience into engagement and marketing terms. Now, first of all, how does the consumer or user engage with the event itself? You know, is this a physical engagement, a mental engagement, spiritual, some sort of engagement? Secondly, how do they co-participate or co-create the event that, that's taking place? Co-creation is something that's becoming very, very popular in terms of discussion at the moment. And then thirdly, what's the symbolic value? You know, what's what's the, the relevance to them? Um, of the event that's taking place. What does it mean to them? Events can be personal or they can be about entertainment. And then number four, what functions does the event serve? You know, is it entertaining? Is it escapism? Is it aesthetic in some way? And then finally, think about the centrality of the experience within the consumption itself. This is what's at the core of it and what always is important. So, to conclude, I suppose, and summarise, I don't have a conclusion as such, more of a summary. Um, the idea of the experience economy, experiential marketing, I've just touched on these, obviously. There's so much out there written on these particular topics. Um, in many ways, they're obviously applicable to festival and event marketing, but I just wanted to finish with perhaps five key questions. What particular aspects of an event or festival makes it unique, memorable and engaging? Secondly, what types of experiences make the most engaging events and festivals? And thirdly, how do meaningful experiences change over time, either for specific events and festivals or generally? How do our audience grow and change with our events and festivals over the course of time? Now, an interesting question, how can we experience, develop experience from the existing interactions of consumers through to new interactions, looking at the way that people interact now? Um, it's not as it used to be. Schmidt predicted that back in 1999 with all these new trends coming into the marketplace. And then finally, how can event and festival marketers address the trends and the challenges of these still continuing um, trends within the marketplace? Omnipresence of IT, supremacy of the brand, and this idea of communications and entertainment being everywhere and being all about the entertainment. So, thank you. That's all I had to say. In traditional lecturer style, I've put the references up there. Um, and I understand you'll have access to the slides. So, um, if you want to watch any of the clips or have a look at the websites, please do so in your own time. They're quite entertaining. Thank you. <laughs>